Okay, ladies, so this video um, walks you through the first portion of our biotechnology notes. Um, there's a potential for some snow or ice next class, so um, I went ahead and made this video just in case that that is the case and we don't and we have online school. Um, if we don't have online school, then most of you will just go through this in class, uh, but then it'll be available to anybody that misses that class day. So remember that for this uh, section of notes, you have a printed out copy that you can use on the exam that's coming up. Uh, but also remember that uh, while you are more than welcome to add any kind of notes to your paper copy uh, that go along with this section, uh, there shouldn't be any additional notes on here from other things that we've covered in this unit. Uh, so feel free to make annotations while we talk through these slides, uh, but then beyond that, um, you shouldn't be adding anything else to it. So the AP curriculum expects you to know sort of what some different biotechnology techniques are used for. It's not that you have to know a lot of detail about how you do each of these techniques or how it works, um, but more just what its application would be, um, and probably most likely, uh, you know, you might have a free response question that describes a laboratory experiment and involves one of these techniques. And so it's really more about being comfortable with the concept so you know what they're talking about, uh, more so than direct questions about these things. Uh, now, some of what you see on this first slide we'll actually be doing in class soon uh, when we do our electrophoresis lab, and you'll get to try your hand at these things. Um, but we, we won't be cloning sheep. I'm more, more, more mean these couple things we'll be uh, doing here pretty soon. Okay, so really for the last 15 years or so now, we have had a rough draft of the human genome. You know, what uh, genes are where on all your given chromosomes and that sort of idea. Uh, they called this the Human Genome Project, and it was sort of an internet-based project where scientists from across the world could work together and, and help to piece together all the genes that you have. Now, it was first published in 2001. We still call this a working draft because we are finding or kind of uh, uh, understanding better new genes all the time. So pretty much every week there's some sort of change or addition that happens here in the human genome. Um, and this is nearly uh, 3 billion base pairs, so this is a whole lot um, of stuff to really look at. Now, they've also sequenced many other species as well, um, so they've been able to um, understand and use DNA better over the last 10 years than um, in any time in, in history, and this is probably um, just going to keep moving forward. Now, we often refer to this area as biotechnology, that in itself doesn't necessarily have to mean genetics, but usually when we talk about biotechnology, we're messing with something in genetics. Um, and if we use some of these techniques for a practical purpose, say um, in the medical field or in forensic science, uh, then we often call it genetic engineering. Um, and so genetic engineering kind of first hit the scene in the late 1970s, and then obviously has, has gotten a lot better as we move toward today. So... This is, my brother is an engineer, so get it, genetic engineering. So here's sort of an outline of what we are going to um, run through in this, uh, this section. Uh, we really want to look at, you know, how did we go from what we learned in the 70s to what we now use today, and, and what are these techniques actually used for? So first thing we're going to look at is to cut and paste DNA, and this might sound a little bit familiar, because this is stuff that you actually cover as freshmen. Not at much depth, but you actually did cover it as freshmen. Um, once we've been able to, to cut the DNA up, maybe piece it back together, our next goal is usually to make a bunch of copies of that DNA. And so this is called amplifying a gene or cloning a gene. And we'll look at the ways in which we do that. Um, then we want to be able to detect a specific DNA sequence um, so, you know, if we're looking for a particular gene, how do we find that? Uh, and that's where we'll cut off here with this video. And then part two of biotechnology, we'll talk about how do we really study someone's DNA. Um, and there's lots of ways we can do that. We have these different blotting techniques. 
We have gel electrophoresis, which is what we're going to do in our lab. Um, and then there's also DNA sequencing techniques to figure out the actual sequence of A's and C's and G's and T's. Um, I'm hoping somebody in this class has seen the Bub Rub video, Bub Rub and his whistles. Um, but it's usually one that students haven't seen before. And this was the very first viral video, I guess you'd say, that I was aware of. I'm sure there were many before it, but the first real uh, go to YouTube and watch this video kind of video. I was a junior in high school and one of my teachers showed me this. Um, and so it still is one of my favorites because it's one of the ones I remembered, but it's one of those real newscasts where they just, they just interviewed the right dude. So, um, you'll watch it in class and if you're not there on this class day, then uh, try to help me remember and we'll, we'll watch it later too so everybody can get to see it. Okay, so our first step is to talk about how you cut and paste DNA and um, pardon the sarcasm here, surprisingly enough, Scientists don't have tiny microscopic scissors and bottles of Elmer's glue that they can use to cut up chromosomes and put chromosomes back together. So, as you might have guessed, the way that they do this is with enzymes, right? Enzymes that are able to catalyze a reaction that will cut a DNA molecule at a very specific sequence or very specific location. We call these restriction endonucleases or restriction enzymes. And these are sometimes referred to jokingly as ninja enzymes because they can slice and dice and cut up the DNA. Now the cool thing is, these are all naturally occurring enzymes that we are able to get from or harvest from bacteria. And what scientists believe is that uh, these are probably sort of the bacterial immune system, so to speak. They're protective for bacteria. So if there's foreign DNA that finds its way into a bacterial cell, uh, basically a virus, right? You know, we as humans can be infected by bacteria and viruses. Bacteria can be infected by viruses. So if a virus puts its DNA into a bacterial cell, it'll use these enzymes that we call restriction enzymes to chop up that viral DNA so it's no longer useful. And what scientists also think is that what a bacterium will do is it will um, temporarily methylate its own DNA to keep it from getting chopped up by the restriction enzymes and then it'll take those methyl groups back off so it's kinda like when we talked about gene expression a couple weeks ago um, there's a whole bunch of these now there's a, a couple hundred different restriction enzymes um, kinda the three most common ones that are used in labs um, is one called Eco R1 one called Hindi 3 and one called BAM H1 uh, and, and these are named after um, really bacteria that they come from. So, um, like Eco R1, you might guess then, comes from E. coli and that sort of deal. But each of these restriction enzymes will cut DNA in a very particular way. The way a restriction enzyme works is it finds a particular sequence in the DNA called a restriction site and it cuts both strands of the DNA at a particular position within that restriction site. So if you look here at the bottom of this slide, here's an example of the way Hindi 3 cuts your DNA. Anywhere in your DNA that you have the sequence AAGCTT from 5' prime to 3', prime, Hindi 3 will clip it between the A's. And it'll clip between the A's on both strands so, again, because these strands are running anti-parallel, that won't be a symmetrical cut, right? You can see the arrows here showing you where we cut it. So we cut the lower strand down here and the upper strand up, um, up here between these A's. Now, each of these little sequences, these restriction sites, are very small. So they're going to happen many different times in your DNA. Um, uh, you know, over and over again, basically, the Hindi 3 enzyme is going to be able to find this restriction site. So it's going to cut at every one of those sites and turn your DNA strand or strands into a bunch of pieces. And we call those restriction fragments. So, since everybody's DNA sequence is different, a given restriction enzyme like Hindi 3 will cut your DNA into a different and unique set of restriction fragments. So for instance, let's say that um, uh, 
you know, we take my DNA, this, and uh, we take um, uh, Dr. Wong's DNA, like this. Now, my sequence will differ from Dr. Wong's, these A's, G's, C's, and T's. So, in my DNA, maybe Hindi 3 would find a restriction site here, and here, and here, giving my DNA one, two, three, four different restriction fragments of those given lengths there, if we cut it up. So I guess I should just kind of erase here, and we end up with these four pieces. Now, if we expose Dr. Wong's DNA to the same exact um, restriction enzyme, Hindi 3, maybe it cuts his here and here. And that's it. That's the only place in his DNA it finds those restriction sites. That's going to give him one, two, three restriction fragments. If I split these. And those are going to be different lengths than my restriction fragments. So, we would have a different result using the same enzyme in these different people. The other cool thing is, their results are reproducible. So as long as you use the same restriction enzyme and the same DNA sample, it should always cut the same way. So if you take my DNA sample and you use Hindi 3, you should always get something that looks like this every time. Now this is really useful in forensics or in seeing if people are related to each other, and we'll get into that more um, in part two of biotechnology. Now, as you might have noticed there on the last page, and I pointed out, you don't usually get a symmetrical cut. Only when the uh, restriction site sequence is totally symmetrical or palindromic would you get a symmetrical cut. So instead, you get this staggered cut or staggered look to the end of your, your DNA, and we call that a sticky end. Now, the reason we call it a sticky end is because those loose nucleotides, like this AATT that's hanging off of here is quote unquote sticky, right? It can readily form base pairs, hydrogen bonds, with other, you know, single strands of DNA, maybe of the sequence TTAA. So, for example, here, when ECOR1 cuts DNA, the restriction site is GAATTC, and it cuts between the G and the A. So we end up with these sticky ends. And these hydrogen bonds uh, could form um, between sticky ends of various fragments. So, first thing to recognize is, potentially, you could just stick right back together here, where we cut it, or, if another DNA sample was cut with the same restriction enzyme, therefore having the same sticky ends, we could potentially piece another DNA source into this one. Now, this pasting, and we'll see this pic a picture of it in a second, uh, can occur between fragments from two DNA samples if we cut them with the same restriction enzyme. The sticky ends form loose bonds with each other, and then DNA ligase, remember that enzyme, can come in and actually reseal the DNA completely and make it two solid strands. We would call this recombinant DNA, right? because our DNA sample has been recombined. So if we go back to my little example that I had um, earlier, and I had my DNA, one, two, three, four little fragments, and we had Dr. Wong's DNA, one, two, three fragments. If we wanted to, we could take this fragment from Dr. Wong and put it right here in my DNA, producing something, if we tied it all back together, which would be my first fragment, and my second fragment, but tied together, right? and my third fragment, and then this fragment from Dr. Wong, and then my fourth fragment. And again, we would, we would then seal that, that whole thing back together into one strand of DNA. And we would call that recombinant DNA. And here's a little better, better illustration of that than what I just drew. All right, if we use that eco R1, we can um, cut this original DNA right up here, and it's going to give us these sticky ends. Then we can take a fragment from another DNA source 
that has also been cut with Eco R1, so its sticky ends are the same. And we can place that into our original DNA that we started with. In other words, I can put a gene into a genome wherever I want to if I can control this process. And once we've done this and formed this recombinant DNA, our next step is to try to clone or amplify certain genes. If we want to focus on just this gray gene that we put in here, we want to have a bunch of copies of it. And so our next step after, after cutting, pasting, recombining DNA is to figure out how to amplify it. We have two options for amplifying genes. One of those is um, a little bit cheaper um, and a little bit older, and that's called in vivo cloning or in vivo amplification. Uh, in vivo meaning um, in the living. So in in vivo amplification, we would use bacteria to multiply our gene. Now, the sort of newer way and more expensive way to do this is an automated process um, that we call in vitro amplification. In vitro um, means within the dish, meaning in a lab, right? And you don't need a living cell to do this. And this is a process called PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. Now you guys are probably familiar with this term in vitro, which can apply to anything that happens in a lab without a, a living cell necessarily. And so in vitro is oftentimes now in our society, thanks to the media, is, is uh, referred to um, in cases of in vitro fertilization, which means in a lab, right? So fertilization, taking an egg cell and sperm cell and putting them together in a lab dish or test tube versus putting them together inside of a, of a person. Um, but in vitro just means in a lab. So, so we have two ways to do it. We're going to look a lot more at the in vivo version because that's what the AP curriculum is more concerned with you understanding. Um, so with that, we need living bacteria. And you might remember um, from our uh, uh, bacterial transformation uh, talk that bacteria have a single circular chromosome as their basic genome. And they also have these plasmids, right, extra nuclear DNA, small circular DNA segments that can replicate separately or can incorporate into the bacterial genome. Now, what we can do is we can make plasmids. So, basically, we will take a plasmid from a bacterium. Um, I'll draw it just like this to start with. Okay, we harvest this plasmid from a bacterium. We can put a DNA gene into it and then go from there. All right, we can make this plasmid kind of what we want it to be. So, let's say, um, this is a really weird example, um, but let's say I want to, I found a gene that'll cause bacteria to just randomly make popcorn. It will generate popcorn for me if I put this gene in there. So we'll call it the pop gene, or the popcorn gene. What I can do is I can take a plasmid from a bacterial cell. I can then insert the popcorn gene into that plasmid and then I can give that plasmid back to the bacteria and it then will have the gene for making popcorn. Now once I've done that we call this a cloning vector. A vector in biology being anything that can like transfer something from one to the, to the, to another so cloning vector. Um, to do this, we need what we just talked about, restriction enzymes. Right, we would cut the plasmid with a restriction enzyme, and we would cut wherever this popcorn gene came from, and then we would piece them back together, forming a recombinant piece of DNA. Um, so, when we put that back into a bacterium, we would then call it a recombinant bacterium. And if the recombinant bacterium starts to multiply and reproduce, I can quickly, in a matter of a couple hours, go from having one copy of this gene to a whole bunch of copies of this gene. Now, 
a lot of times the question is why would we do this sort of thing and so here in this picture just another example of what we talked about here we'll take a plasmid from a bacterial cell and we'll take a gene from some other source of DNA and we'll put them together forming this recombinant plasmid cloning vector we put that plasmid back into the bacterium and we allow that bacterium to multiply greatly making a whole bunch of copies of that gene inside there now sometimes scientists will do this to study a gene better or to make copies of a gene that could have some use or function or other times we would do this because we're interested in the protein that would come from that gene so maybe there's a protein we want to research that we could use as a treatment for a, uh, an illness or something like that so we'll make a whole bunch of copies of it and then allow it to be transcribed and translated into the protein product so um, gene examples from from realistic cases there's genes that make plants more resistant to diseases and pests so we can copy those genes get them into crop plants and they won't be as susceptible to pests we also have bacteria now that I think we've talked about in in previous classes that um, can break down oil spills they can digest oil so you can give that gene to bacteria to make them capable of, of uh, cleaning up the waste and then protein examples um, there's a protein that you can now get at a hospital that will help break up a clot in fat in a case of a heart attack or a stroke um, so we can get that protein kind of made in the lab if we can make bacteria with this gene um, or some different human growth hormones or just human hormones in general insulin is another one um, if we can get bacteria to make this human growth hormone by giving them that human gene we can then use that hormone to supplement um, a kid who, who um, isn't growing enough. Now this all sounds maybe not simple but, but not real complicated but really it is pretty complicated to do this process and there's a couple of reasons, there's a couple of problems with trying to do this in vivo cloning. The first problem is that what we actually do is we mix a cut plasmid, so maybe it looks, you know, like this, with the entire genome of another organism or cell, and then we mix those together. So we've got this cut up plasmid and this cut up entire genome. So in our test tube, what we probably end up with is not just this plasmid that we wanted, that was, um, you know, this popcorn gene mixed into this plasmid. What we probably actually end up with is, is this, but also a whole bunch of other ones too. Like maybe there's um, a pizza making gene, or a Jagteza uh, pizza making gene, or um, a Freaky Friday food, whatever that is, um, in our cafeteria. And there's genes for all those things too. If we mix that all together, we're probably going to make plasmids with the pizza gene and plasmids with the Jagteza gene and plasmids with the Freaky Friday gene, along with plasmids for the popcorn gene. But if we're only interested in the popcorn gene, all this other stuff is a waste and this is going to get in the way. So we're going to have to kind of deal with that. Now the other issue is, when you just drop this into solution, which is how it works, it's just a liquid in a test tube, when you drop this into solution, a lot of your plasmids that you've cut open like this guy are just going to go back together right their sticky ends will base pair with each other so uh, a large percentage of the plasmids that you um, expose to this are not going to pick up a new gene at all they're just going to reseal and be the original plasmid again now this approach will give us several different bacteria that have several different plasmids in them. Some of them that popcorn plasmid, but others will have that pizza plasmid and that Freaky Friday plasmid and that Jagteza plasmid, and so on and so forth. So all of this together we would call a genomic library. You know, lots of different plasmids, lots of different books there. The way, uh, I'm not sure if it's your textbook or another resource talks about this is, consider that you have to write a research paper and maybe one chapter or a couple pages in a big book at the library would help you with your research. This is kind of like you have to read the entire book to get to those two pages that'll help you.
So again, you have to look at all these different bacteria with all these different recombinant plasmids to get to that one, that popcorn plasmid that we're really interested in. So to do this, we will separate out the different bacteria through a couple different methods that you don't have to worry about. And we'll place each one into, uh, well actually, we'll, we'll, we'll extract the DNA from each one and we'll place it into its own little well on this big plastic plate. So we'll put it in this its own little, little kind of cubicle in this big plastic plate. And then we'll hunt for that particular sequence, that popcorn gene sequence using a process called nucleic acid hybridization. So to kind of back up, we've cut and pasted our DNA, we've amplified it, now we want to be able to detect a certain sequence within there, and that's what nucleic acid hybridization is. Now this sounds like a big deal, but when you see hybridization, just think matching. So in other words, it's your base pairing rules, right? And that's the tool that we can use, right? If we know the base, the base, uh, excuse me, the nucleotides that occur in your gene, you can expose something to it that is the opposite nucleotides, right? The base pairing partners, and we'll be able to bind to it and identify it as the one that we're looking for. Here's how this works: we would expose each set of DNA, each of these um, potential plasmids we've made, to a little. RNA or DNA strand that is complementary to the gene in question. Now this is a little bit tricky because we might not really know the DNA sequence of the gene. So for instance the popcorn gene, right? Let's say our popcorn gene has a sequence of A, A, T, G, C, C. We might not really know that. I mean, if we're out to study the popcorn gene or we haven't been able to study it yet, we might not have much to go on. So there's a couple different ways scientists can do this. Don't get too worried about the details here, but maybe they know what the protein is like and they can figure out the amino acids and they can work backwards using the codon table to try to figure out what its DNA sequence actually is. Or maybe there's another similar gene in nature, you know, a popcorn gene that appears in some other species that... If it's a popcorn gene, it probably has a very similar sequence. So you might be able to kind of make some guesses or tries using another uh, gene sequence as well. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to expose our all these different samples we have to what's called a nucleic acid probe. A nucleic acid probe would be labeled with radioactivity or fluorescence so it would fluoresce and we'd be able to see it. It would light up and we'd be able to tell where it bound. So... Let's say that I expose all my samples to a probe that is T, T, A, C, G, G. And I did it in red here because it'll light up, right? It'll be fluorescent. It's going to base pair with that popcorn gene, right? Because it's complementary to the popcorn gene. So the only little wells on my plate filled with all this genomic library, all these different bacteria, the only wells that have popcorn gene in them will be the ones that this, this fluorescent tag tags itself to, and those will be the ones that light up, and then we know which ones actually have that popcorn gene. So here's what this looks like. Um, again, don't worry too much about the sequence of events here, the technique used, but we've got all these plates and in each one of these little spots on here, you would have a, a, a new you know, recombinant plasmid that was created when you tried to do this in vivo amplification. Then you put it in a bag, you expose it to a solution that has these radioactively labeled probes, and wherever those probes actually stick is where the sequence is complementary to it. So at the end, we can kind of generate a, a picture, is what this is, last part's kind of showing you, where only that single little dot on our big plate we started with lights up. That tells us that in that well is where um, there is DNA that contains the popcorn gene. So whatever bacteria that one came from, those are the bacteria we're interested in. So maybe you've got these plates all numbered. You know, every one of these wells is numbered. So at the end, we can say, okay, the DNA in well number 47 uh, is the popcorn gene. So we'll go back to our bacterial culture in our little plate in the incubator like the lab we did 
number 47, and those bacteria are the ones that we want to reproduce so that we can get a whole bunch of this popcorn gene. Now there's actually sort of an easier and cheaper way to tell if um, a particular bacterium has picked up a gene, and that's observation of the phenotype. In other words, what we've done with this PGLO lab in our class. You know, a genotypic change, adding a new gene, should result in a phenotype change, and that phenotype change, depending on what it is, might be kind of visibly observable. So for instance, we had two examples of this in our PGLO lab. If the bacteria um, were able to take up our PGLO plasmid, they would pick up a gene for ampicillin or antibiotic resistance and a gene that would make them glow or fluoresce. So when we have our plates of bacteria afterwards, if they can grow on an ampicillin infused surface and if they glow in the dark, that's evidence that those picked up the sample. So kind of to, to jump back, we might not have needed to do all that nucleic acid hybridization stuff in my silly example I gave you. We might have just had to wait and seen which set of bacteria made popcorn. And whichever ones made popcorn, clearly, were the ones that picked up the popcorn gene. So sometimes this works. It's a lot easier. Other times you need that extra day of work and you got to do nucleic acid hybridization to figure out which gene um, uh, is which inside there. Now today, um, and you don't have to know nearly as much about how this works, but today scientists are able to amplify a gene in a lab with a process called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. But here's what they do. It's not so much that they make a whole bunch of copies of uh, the segment on, on their own. They still use bacteria. But what they do is they're able to isolate that particular gene and make a bunch of copies of it to start with and then put that into bacteria and they know from the start that all the bacteria carry that gene. So in other words, we can amplify this popcorn gene put it specifically into a bunch of bacteria and skip that hybridization step and any worries like that because then we know, or in this case we would know, every bacterium is indeed carrying the popcorn gene because that's the only gene we put in there. Now PCR is really helpful if you have a tiny sample of DNA to start with. So a lot of times they'll use this in forensics, right? They'll get a very tiny DNA sample from someone from some blood evidence or something like that, they will then amplify that gene with PCR, or the, the DNA sample they have with PCR, so that they can run a whole bunch of different tests, and they won't necessarily you know, destroy and, and get rid of that tiny little DNA sample they started with. Now this is an automated procedure, meaning computers are involved, it um, doesn't take nearly as much uh, physical effort on the part of the scientist. Um, and, and literally in an afternoon, it can make billions of copies of a small DNA segment um, within a test tube. Now, once you have these copies, like I said, you put them into a living bacterium, allow that bacterium to reproduce again, um, kind of like we did with the other one. But in this case, we know that all the bacteria have what we are actually looking for. So to kind of jump back to that analogy before of the using a whole book on a research paper, this is like you're allowed to only read or photocopy those two pages in the book that matter for your research project um, and use them and you don't have to worry about the rest of that book. Now here's how this works and this is the basic process. It's, it's rather complicated and so we're looking at it from just a very basic level and, and this is probably going to be confusing enough. First thing we do is we take a target strand of DNA and we heat it up because heating will cause the hydrogen bonds to break down and will cause the DNA um, to denature. Now, this means something a little different than when we talked about proteins. It's not really going to break down or destroy it or anything like that, but it's just going to separate the two strands from each other. So we start out with this double helix, and by heating it up, we can separate those two strands into two different strands. Next thing we're going to do is... well. To go back, we're going to keep it hot then, because right? as long as we keep it hot, it won't go back together. If you allow this to cool down, it'll immediately reform its bonds and the two strands go right back together. So we're going to keep this um, warmed up, but we're going to cool it just a little bit so that um, some DNA uh, nucleotides that are loose in our test tube uh, can be used and can be 
um, formed into what we call primers. Now, it's, you know, we had RNA primers when we talked about replication. These are actually DNA, but we can start to then put these little primers um, on the DNA here um, as we start to cool it down just a little bit. Now, scientists were kind of stuck at this point uh, without having the help of a really cool bacterial enzyme called TAC pol polymerase. Now, you don't have to know this detail really, but TAC comes from Thermus aquaticus, Oops. which is a cool bacterium that they discovered in, a, in deep sea vents, um, thermal vents, that can withstand really high temperatures and will still be able to replicate its DNA. So TAC polymerase is DNA polymerase from a Thermus aquaticus bacterium that will work at high temperatures. So we can put this TAC polymerase in here and it will actually add or replicate the DNA even under those hot temperatures to keep the two strands separated. Then we can just keep doing this over and over again and we can copy this target sequence that we're looking for. So in this test tube, we got a DNA strand, we got a bunch of loose nucleotides, and we've got the enzymes we need to, to build new DNA. Now don't get too worried if this is a little bit confusing because it's not a huge, huge, huge concern. Um, the big thing you want to know is that PCR is a way to copy or amplify a gene. Again, on the AP exam, they're probably not super concerned with how this works or the technique behind it, but just that you know why you would use PCR. Now, here's another picture of that. All right, we can separate or denature our target sequence. Um, then we allow it to start re-annealing, coming back together a little bit with the primers. And then we add new nucleotides and extend it out using that TAC polymerase. Now, what we're looking to do, though, is we're looking to form a true copy or new, you know, uh, amplification of this gene. So we're really interested in making ones that are not semi-conservative anymore. That's not the best way to say that. That don't contain any of that new original DNA, their, uh, their old original DNA. They're all just brand new DNA. So technically what this picture is showing you is you kind of have to do it, get to a third cycle before you actually get a copy of your gene that is all new DNA and doesn't contain any of that original, what we would call genomic DNA. And that's just because of the semi-conservative nature of replication, right? Um, each time we do it, we maintain some of the original. So for those first couple rounds, you're still going to have part of the DNA here that we started with. Um, but after three rounds and then on forward, we can make copies that are totally new and from scratch. Uh, and like I said, you can just let this run. It's an automated process, and you can get billions of copies of a DNA strand um, in a pretty short amount of time. Now that concludes part one. That was long enough, I know. Um, part one of the biotechnology notes, uh, and then we'll move into part two, how we study your chromosomes uh, um, here shortly, uh, and then that will wrap all of this up and actually wrap up our whole uh, unit five on molecular genetics. Thanks for listening.